Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, we're here with Carl Baker, and uh, we're talking about Myanmar today. Uh, he is the senior advisor for Pacific Forum, uh, and we love to talk to him about things all around the world involving diplomacy and international and foreign policy and so forth. And today we're talking about Myanmar, and I, I cast the show as will Myanmar ever get a rest for military coups. I'm not sure he agrees that's a fair premise for our discussion. So Carl, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Jay, uh, good to be back. And and that's, I, I would certainly like to see that. I guess that's sort of the aspiration for everybody, but whether we can really do that or not is uh, is going to be a real challenge, I think, because the, the military in Myanmar is, is well insinuated into the fabric of society. Well, it's interesting because if you if you don't have representative government and as a call it a power vacuum, uh, the military is a is a is a good prospect to fill it, and in Myanmar they filled it for a long time. Well, you know, and and you know, it's 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 part of the part of the region too. I mean, these are old empires that uh, you know built up fairly significant territory back from from the 900s to to the to the colonial area in the 18 1800s and so you know so there is a there is a tendency to see strongman centralized uh, sort of rule in these countries so Myanmar isn't unique remember we have Thailand next door and they of course are also very uh, very oriented to military coups so they've all had their share you know, and and while Cambodia isn't a military coup, it's a, a military government. It certainly is a, a centrally controlled government. So yeah, I think if, if we can put up that map of, of Myanmar, we can we can get started here. So if you if you look at the map, you can see that that Myanmar it, there's a there's a central valley that, that focuses on the Irrawaddy River, and that that river really runs pretty much from just to, just north of Mandalay all the way down through Yangon. And then there's feeders that, that feed that Irrawaddy Irrw River that come out of the Himalayas. And so it's really centered around, around the Irrawaddy River, one of the great rivers in Asia. And that's, and that's really the focus, because that's where the, the Burman population, where the word Burma comes from, is, is in that central area. And that's where they're, they're located. That's where, that's where they're the dominant area. Uh, group of people. But if you look on the periphery, you'll see that there's there's states that have been created. And this was done right after the the end of end of the colonial area at the end of World War II, when 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 Aung San, Aung San Suu Kyi's father, actually was able to come together and, and reach agreement with the ethnic groups that comprise this place called, called Myanmar. So if you go back to that map, you can see it, it, it goes on the bottom, there's the Rakhine state, which is, which is of course, the, the area where the, the Rohingya are lo were, were located and still are located. It's, it's largely uh, uh, Muslim in that area. And, and there's a lot of people that in the British era that migrated down into that area from Bangladesh. And, and what happened in the, with the Rakhine it, back, in the, back in 20, 2018, 2017, 2018, is the, the military the Myanmar military pushed them back out into, into Bangladesh in Cox Bazar. And that's part of the story of what happened when, when Aung San Suu Kyi lost her credibility in the international community because of uh, the genocide, the accusations of genocide by the, by the Myanmar government. But that, that, and then when you go up around, what you see in, in Myanmar is you have, you have the Chin and then you have the, uh, the, the uh, Kachin and the Shan and the, and the Kayan states, and all those are, are made up of ethnic minorities of, of the same name. And what happened in 1947, when Myanmar was created as a, as a country, is all those states had agreed to, to a federal system where you had states that had significant autonomy from the central government located in, at the time, Yangon. And of course, later on, they moved up to Naypyidaw. And so, and so what you have is you have a history of, of conflict in those border regions. And so that's, that's really Myanmar in a nutshell, is you have, you have the Central Valley that's controlled by the Burmese, and, and they've always controlled that area. And then they've always struggled for national unification to, to get those outer regions 
part of the part of the government. And so that's really the the the, the single most important focus for anyone in Myanmar is national unity. And that's the rationale that the military has used four different times since 1947 to establish a coup government because they were concerned about the national unity of Myanmar. And they felt that the, the civilian government couldn't fulfill that requirement because they weren't strong enough and they weren't uh, dealing with those peripheral regions. And so, now, from, from 1947 on then, there's been this history of the Ponglong conferences, and, and they have been the attempt to replicate what Aung San did in 1947, where he reached the agreement with these, with these outer, outer states to, to form a, a federated, federated union. And, and to, the, to date, that's still where the conflict is mostly occurring. So what you see since the coup in, in uh, February of 2021 is you have these, these conflicts that are, are in the peripheral regions. But what's different this time with the coup is that there's some level of, of oppression that's occurring among the, the Bamar as well. And so that's a little bit different because in the past the, the, the conflict was always with the with the ethnic organ the ethnic armies which are located in the periphery. Now you have the the, the military is also in conflict with the, the Burmese people in the Central Valley because they, they are opposing the, the democratically elected government. Wow, so much contention. <clears throat> so much argument over such a long period of time. They would be so much more successful if they could have a, a unification. Uh, don't, don't they appreciate that? Does, he, does the person on the street, the man on the street appreciate um, that it would be better for them economically if they could stop fighting with every, everybody? Yeah, sure. But, but the, the problem is, is how do you do that? Because they've never been able to reach consensus. And, you know, and when the when the democratically elected government, the, the National League of Democracy, was in power, they attempted a Ponglong Congress, and they were unable to, to get the, the Karens specifically, but other ethnic groups were unwilling to go along with the, with the agreement to establish a, a unified federated system. And, and part of the problem is, is, is the, the, of course, in any federal system is the degree of autonomy granted to, to the individual states. And of course, you know, when you look at those states, the, the, the states really are go, go beyond what the ethnic group actually controls. And so you have, you have a conflict built in because you have Burmese and you have the eth ethnic group that are in conflict over, over resources and over control of those, of those specific states. And so that's what complicates the whole, the whole idea of establishing a, a functional federal system. You know, the Burmese that I know, not many of them, they're very nice, sweet, kind people, gentle people. I don't understand how they could be involved in genocide against the Rohingya or otherwise. What are the two personalities here? Well, no, I mean, I have the same, I had the same impression. We did a lot of work in Myanmar uh, from really 1914 to, to uh, 1914, 2014. <laughs> what, what century is this anyway? <laughs> from, 20, from 2014 to 2020 or 2019. And, and, and they are very friendly, including the military. The military are very, very sincere in, in their belief, though, that, that they are the only group of people that can really ensure national unity because they feel that that their institution is is key to to achieving that and and the problem is is that the the, the institution itself the military itself is has has corrupted itself by believing that and so and so it's an endemic problem to the military that they can't get beyond the idea that they have to have military control to be able to unify the country because only the military can do that and you know, and and then and then beyond that, there's a there's a, a very strong sentiment that I was I was surprised to see among the military about it was really just simply a visceral hatred to to toward some people, specifically the Rohingya, and and of course you you can't use Rohingya as a term in Myanmar. They're 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 Bengalis, 
and and you know and it's, it's the word is almost spit out of their mouth when they use that word because they feel very much that that and this goes back to the uh, the English colonial era where these people were located up in the up in the areas of India if you go back to the map the India and Bangladesh and moved down into the Rakhine area uh, you know it's hard to wrap your mind around exactly where yeah, where yeah, so, Burma is and what it is yeah so you see what happened is during the colonial administration you had you had the the English basically controlling all of that area left of Myanmar as well as Myanmar and so and so these these workers were moving back and forth as as part of the part of the British Empire. At the end of the empire, of course, the, the, the people in in Yangon felt that those people in Rakhine should now go back to Bengal or go back to to what is modern day Bangladesh. You know, and and so that was that's always been a real sore spot is is that particular area in Rakhine. And now, if you look at the Chin, which is right above there, it's very heavily Christian. And so, you know, that's that's sort of a, a very minority, a very, a very minor population. It's not it's not heavily populated. All those peripheral areas are fairly underpopulated. So there's probably four or five hundred thousand people in that Chin area. But that's you know, that's that's a, again a, a point of conflict because they are are very different from from the 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 Burmese that are are controlling the central areas of, of Myanmar. Well, maybe we're going to take a moment and, and uh, uh, look at the definition of uh, unification. It, it sounds like if you're not if you're not on my team, <clears throat> then I don't want to unify with you. I want to squash you somehow. Well, that's that's what's happened. I think that's what's happened with the military. Is that that is that is sort of their definition of of. A federal a federal system is that the the Burmese very much control all the all the assets and all the resources in those areas and of course those those peripheral areas because they're mountainous are are rich in resources there there there's a lot of timber there's a lot of minerals that are mined out of out of those mountainous regions and so yeah that's part of the problem is is how do you actually share power how do you share resources when when the the lowland uh, area has has the dominant population the dominant culture and the resources are located out in the periphery where there's there's very very uh very dug in kinds of, of military organizations run by these ethnic uh, eth ethnic groups well it doesn't does it do them any good does it do the military hunter guys any good um to do genocide on the rohingya i mean is it does it help toward unification in some way um does it help economically does it help in terms of sharing the resources uh, why do they do that it just seems like blatant historic hatred well and and i think that's that's sort of the the outsider's view and it's very easy to take that view you know i mean if you if you talk to the the military their their story was you're not you're not getting both sides of the story you're only getting the side of the story from you know from these bleeding heart liberal uh international organizations and you know and and so what really happened was the the rohingya attacked the villages and they and they killed people and they they are the ones who started the fight and and the military was simply responding to the egregious actions by the the uh, Rohingya army. Do you accept yeah. that, Carl? Well, I mean, there's there's probably some truth to to some of the some of the statements that are being made by the military, but they're also, of course, you know, being over overstated. They're being exaggerated by the military, and and certainly, you know, and and this was the this was the argument that we had in several several meetings uh, in a row with these guys is if this is true then you should tell your story and make it believable but don't don't just just say that it's true and not try to demonstrate how it's true because you know they they would say they would say that this is what's happened but then you know their next sentence would be you know and those stupid bengalis they just have children and they have too many kids and they and they don't they don't work and you know <laughs> that 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 sort of sort of racist kind of rhetoric yeah, you know yeah. and and so you know and so it you know it just doesn't ring true in in yeah. in the end it just doesn't ring true and i'm sure this is the same experience that the uh, you know that the human rights watch and people like that have when they go to these regions you know, part of every hunter, every coup like that is, um, you know, the basic mission of perpetuating your power. 
um, you, you don't you don't want to lose your power um, and you want to hold on to it for as long as you can and take you take steps to do that. And, and I wonder, um, you know, you, you mentioned that there at least for a time was a representative government, a democracy yeah. even um, in Myanmar. I wonder if you would ask uh, one of the military coup guys, uh, hey, when you finished your, your mission of uh, unifying Myanmar, but would it be time to go back to a representative government? Is that what you're actually hoping for? <clears throat> or is it rather that uh, when you have achieved that, you'll, you'll, you'll consolidate your own power as a, as a coup? And, and we, you know, obviously we ask those kinds of questions. And in fact, their answer is, oh, yes, we, we believe that that is the right way to go. You know, and, and what happened in this democratically elected government, remember, is that Thane Sein was, was a military general. And, and he is the one who actually transferred power to himself. And then, and then the, next, the next election was, was where uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party won. Now, Aung San Suu Kyi couldn't be president because she's a, she was married to a foreigner and her children are foreigners. And so she can't, she can't legitimately be president of, of, the, uh, of the country according to the constitution. So there was a, a guy named Nguyen Mint who was, who was nominally the president. But of course, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi took the role of, of state councilor and took on several of the ministries. And so she actually was, was controlling the government. But in the meantime, the military, of course, controlled not only the military, but also the ministries of borders, border areas, and home affairs. So they continue to control those peripheral areas. So, so their argument is, is that, no, we are only here to, to, to unify these, these peripheral regions. And, you know, and, and to support that, uh, that argument is they actually did run a Panglong conference during the NLD era, and it was unsuccessful. You know, and, and of course, the military held the NLD responsible for being unsuccessful because they couldn't get they couldn't get some of the some of the ethnic armies to join in 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 resolving the issues around federalism under under the uh, leadership of the NLD. And so I'm sure part of the rationale for going back to this to this uh, military control was, yes, preservation of power, but also because they failed in their attempt to unify the country and we can't stand around waiting for things to get worse because these ethnic areas are, are, making, are making noise again. And, and if we don't do something, do something dramatic, we're going to lose uh, Myanmar. I mean, that, that, again, that's, that's giving you the, the, the sort of the military explanation of why they had to do this. And you know, it sounds like uh, you guys got to fight like hell or you won't have a country anymore. Yeah. Don't ask me where I got that. Uh, yeah, from. well, it just so happens to be January 6th today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so, you know, that's, that, that's kind of where we are. And, you know, and I think th the interesting part I found of what's happening now is that the, the, there's this, this shadow government that's been formed, and it's, it's called the National, the National Unity Government. And it's, it's made up primarily of, of Aung, San Su, Aung San Suu Kyi's old party, the, the National League for Democracy. But there's also this, this thing called the National Unity Coordinating Council. And what's interesting about that is they are talking about a federal system and they have support from, from the ethnic groups. They have support from the, from the Burmese in the Central Valley, who for the first time feel like they're being left out by the military. And so there's, there is this movement. And in fact, the, the United States in, in the National Defense Authorization Act does recognize the goals of, of the NUG as being unifying the country under a federal system. You know, and so the, 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 the sense of Congress that comes out of that, there isn't really much, much in the way of, of firm action that's been, that's been mandated uh, in, in the legislation by the United States. But there is the, a provision to, to promote that vision for, for Myanmar. Uh, now, how that, how that gets translated into action I, is, is complicated because you can't simply go hand money to, to the Koran and to the, to the Kachin and, and the Shan states and expect that to, to work its way into a, a coherent strategy of, of how do you get past the coup. But it, it, it's, it's encouraging, I think, again, like I said at the beginning, is that there's this, this effort 
inside Myanmar to actually come up with a, a, a response to the military's proposal that it, it alone can deal with the peripheral issues, uh, the, the issues in the periphery of the country. Was well, that a free and fair conversation, or is the coup uh, determined to uh, uh, keep those keep those guys at bay? Oh, there, there's I mean, there's no question, you know, and and th this gets to to they're they're not they're not acknowledging the NUG by any means, or or the National Unity uh, Coordination Conference. There, that's that's this is this is all you know shadow government kind of stuff that's going on. No, there's no way that the the coup the, the coup leaders are saying we will return to democracy through free and fair elections after uh, I think in uh, 2023 in late 2023 is their is their target date. Mm -hmm. So I mean clearly when you look at what what the 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 junta is doing is they're kind of trying to follow the 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 Thai lead in in talking about. How how Thailand you know went through a a, uh, a a coup in 2014 and then and then was able to run elections and win the election in 2019. So so Priyat Anchoa, you know, Priyat, uh, Prime Minister Priyat was was the general in in charge of the junta and now he's the he's the prime minister, uh, Priyat Chanucha. You know so so he he is the model that I think they're trying to follow. And, and what, what the NUG is trying to do is they're trying to say, look, there's a better alternative to, to going through that model. And so then it becomes, uh, uh, the, the problem then becomes is how do, they, how do they deal with that? And of course, ASEAN, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, is, is involved with that. You know, and, they, and they came up with their, with their five-point consensus, which includes the need to have dialogue between the factions. And, and the junta is simply not doing that. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is today, as of today, in fact, uh, Hun Sen, the Cambodian prime minister, is visiting Myanmar. And he's the first official visitor. And of course, Hun Sen also happens to be this year's chairman for ASEAN. And so the ASEAN states, specifically Indonesia and, and Malaysia, are very concerned that Hun Sen is trying to do an end run on ASEAN and try to make a deal with, with uh, the Junta, with, with the junta yeah. to, to come to some resolution and mm -hmm. get, get Myanmar back into ASEAN. Because ASEAN so far has refused to let the, the Junta participate in ASEAN meetings. And, and the next big meeting is the ASEAN retreat in February in, in Shimri, uh, which, of course, Hun Sen would love to be able to say, look, I've brought Myanmar in, and, and now we can start normalizing relations within ASEAN. So it's, you know, so you can see the dynamic is playing out where the strongmen in, in Southeast Asia are, are sort of encouraging what the junta is doing. And then there's a question of whether ASEAN can really step forward and, and be more assertive and try to promote the, the NUG or trying to promote something other than just accepting the, the junta as a fait accompli. It sounds delicate and complicated. It's delicate and complicated. And, you know, and, and the United States you know, has not really done much. Uh, I was going to ask you, what is our policy vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, was it NUG and the Junta? Which, do, what do we publicly favor? What are we doing in, in a public well, sphere of foreign policy? Yeah, well, pub publicly we're saying, we, as I said, we're, we support the, the goals of the NUG, and, and the NDAA does say that you have to, you know, it, it, specifically the U.S. U.S. policy says you have to secure unconditional release of all political prisoners. It says they should promote genuine national reconciliation, and uh, it it should. Uh, I'm, I'm looking here because I can't remember this. Uh, it, it wants to impose costs on the military. It doesn't say how. Not nothing specific. It wants to impose costs, but but you know the most significant part is it wants to support and legitimize the national unity government of the Republic of Myanmar. You know, and so I think that's the most significant statement that comes out. And and there's really, really, there's there's some money that's been put to it in in terms of humanitarian assistance, uh, but not much. And it's not clear how that money how that money gets gets transmitted into Myanmar. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of questions, of course. And then the other the other thing is there's their talk is there's talk about uh, about sanctioning, uh, you know, the 
the, the oil and gas companies because that's where the hunt is getting their money. Of course, the, the problem is, you know, typically in, in a situation like this, when you impose sanctions, the people that suffer are, are the are the people that are are not the ones government. who should not be sanctioned. The, the, the ones who <laughs> yeah. should not be sanctioned, they, they're the ones, of course, who end up suffering because yeah. because yeah. the hunter will take care of itself first. Yeah. So you know, so so the you know the easy the easy answer, of course, is always sanctions. But sanctions are are, are complicated in the situation as well. They um, they seem old fashioned these days. That's my my cut. But let me ask you, what what should Tony Blinken do here? I mean, to take a fresh look at it, you know, in view of all the things you've mentioned. Um, what would be a better foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar? Well, I, I mean, I think you know they have they're on the right track by by saying you know we su we support all these things we support you know we support the ASEAN five points which involve uh, dialogue between all the parties you know and and recognition that that if you send somebody in that they should be able to talk to the opposition. Uh, you know, I mean, I think those those are reasonable reasonable prospects, and and to me, uh, I mean, support ASEAN, you know, push ASEAN into into a situation where it's kind of forced to deal with this, not not Hun Sen by himself, but but ASEAN as a group, you know, kind of force force ASEAN into a role of of taking some responsibility. Uh, you know, the, the problem is, of course, is that China, Russia, uh, are busy providing support to to Myanmar in the process. Well, you know, I, I, I want to ask you about that. One of the news articles that popped up when I Googled this was that China just gave Myanmar, I guess that's the military group, a submarine. Nobody gives me submarines. <laughs> yeah. Do they well, really need a submarine? And, and why China giving them a submarine? Well, I mean, it, it, it complements their other one submarine that they got from India. And, and I mean, the, the, the idea of, of submarines in Southeast Asia is, is sort of a, 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 a point that I've made other places that are, it, it's really silly. I mean, to, to have two submarines, you have one in, you want have, have one in constant dry dock and the other one that can probably range out for a couple of days at a time. But everybody in Southeast Asia thinks they need submarines now. And so and so Myanmar wants to play wants to play the submarine game too. You know, uh, you know, so it makes no sense for, for Myanmar to. So what to, is China trying to do there? What, you know, uh, what, what what is the relationship? And, uh, you know, are they in, on the Belt Road? Are they, are they one of uh, China's uh, investment targets? What is happening? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, China owns a huge gas pipeline that runs, you know, runs through through Myanmar up into up to Yunnan province. And so, you know, so they're invested in that. They've also tried to build a dam up uh, up in the northern region. It, it's called the Mitsoni Dam. And, and there's been huge local protests against it because it blocks off, I mean, it cuts off the river in the Irrawaddy. And, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it, it basically China is, is extracting resources. And of course, you know, it, it takes, you know, it takes its, its high moral position of saying we don't involve ourselves in in uh, internal affairs of other governments you know that kind of that kind of noise but in the meantime you know they've supported they've supported the junta in in saying that uh, they, they've in in resisting any attempts at the security council to get any any kind of a resolution out on on uh, condemning the the rohingya and condemning the the junta and and some of the some of the atrocities that have come about since since the junta has been basically you know committing genocide in in the outer regions of of uh, myanmar as well yeah that seems to be a, a, a fact we're known worldwide and and you wonder um you know why there isn't more made of the involvement of uh, West Criminal Court of Justice in in uh, the Hague, uh, or uh, truth truth commissions, uh, or some kind of external influence on uh, Myanmar. Is the hunt to reject all of that? Fact is that we all know there have been uh, human rights violations and war crimes essentially going on. Well, I mean, this goes back. This goes back to the to the days of NLD when when they looked the other way over the Rohingya, you know, and that's you know, and that's when when Aung San Suu Kyi lost her lost her her Nobel Peace Prize and was was uh, you know really shunned uh, internationally. And I'm sure part of the reason why she did that back in in 2017 was because she understood that there wasn't much room for error in in 
mollifying the the uh, uh, Myanmar military. And so she she kind of took the heat from the international community. But I don't I think she was in a position where she couldn't really do much because because her her authority was was fairly constrained to begin with. And and if she resisted the military in that case, they would have just uh, pushed her out sooner rather than at the at the point of the new of the new uh, uh, legislature. Too bad she was such a darling for a while. Well, she was, and and I, I, to me, that was part of the problem. Is is it was it was so focused on her that that we sort of forgot the larger context of of Myanmar and and got a little bit too too locked in on on treating her as the champion. And in fact, she 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 couldn't fulfill those those expectations. I think. I mean, her 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 role was was more limited than we were willing to admit. Yeah. She's not coming back, right? She's she's uh, a little too old right now, too much baggage. She's not coming back politically, right? I, I, I well, she'll she'll always be there. I mean, she's Aung San's daughter, you know, and, and so you know, so she 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 is a she is a living legend, and so she will always be part of any in any civilian government in Myanmar, mm -hmm. be be involved in some way. I mean, she's she is she is that that important she's she's she has that status i mean she can't not be but no i mean she's not ever going to come back as as the leader of of myanmar i don't think and i don't think i don't think she she wants to quite honestly like you say she's she's in her 70s and you know now they've got all these trumped up charges that that they're trying to trying to push on her like you know, Im importing walkie talkies and you know i saw that of violating COVID nineteen protocols and all that—it's just silly stuff, you know that that they're using as as an excuse. But you know, I think I think she she still represents the democracy to the outside to the outside world in Myanmar, and that's that's fortunate and unfortunate because, like I said, she her capacity is somewhat limited and just on who she is, and so there there has to be there has to be a new face. If, if that's what you mean by by trying to trying to reestablish democracy in Myanmar, there has to be a new face to replace Aung San Suu Kyi, whoever that might be, and 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 that's not clear who that is. There isn't there isn't a real emergent, uh, charismatic person who's who's going to show up and and replace her. It all sounds like a confluence of um, of factors that are negative. I mean, it, it, and correct me, please correct me, but I, I see. Uh, Myanmar is one of the most um, fragmented, um, disrupted um, countries in Southeast Asia. The, the rest of them are having problems too, but not quite like this. And if you had to draw a line from where they are today to where they could be, should be, to be a productive member of that part of the world, it's a long way. Am I right to say that they are at the bottom of the heap in terms of organizing a reasonable representative um, successfully economic, economically successful country. Uh, well, I mean, you, you don't forget you've got uh, you've got Laos next door, <laughs> and uh, we, have to, that, we have to do another show on Laos. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Myanmar Myanmar is a, a country of fifty, you know, over fifty million people, and and it, it, it's really quite vibrant. I mean, when 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 we were there, I mean, I, it's pretty remarkable how how fast it grew. I mean, from from nineteen, gosh, I should keep doing that. From twenty fourteen to 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 twenty nineteen, the changes that occurred in those five years were pretty remarkable. I mean, they rebuilt their entire airport. They they you know they they. Traffic, traffic in, in Yangon was was just crazy, just overnight, you know. And and so there's, it, it wouldn't take much to 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 get the flame reignited, if we can if we can get past uh, you know this this junta. And so in some respects, you know, if if we can if we can find a way to come to some reconciliation between between the the NUG and the junta, I think we could move forward. And that's why I. While people are dismissive of ASEAN's ability to do anything, you know, I think that there is some some potential for ASEAN to 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 make progress, and and if they do, it could move pretty fast. So I it would, would be a feather in ASEAN's cap, wouldn't it? 
It, it would, and and ASEAN knows that, but it also knows that that it's very constrained in what in what it's capable of doing. And you have these these I'll call them a dilettante like Hun Sen, who's willing to, you know, ditch ditch ASEAN for his own personal gratification and personal glory in in trying to solve the problem by himself. And so you've got you've got that problem with ASEAN too, is that you have other people in the region who who aren't always as committed to ASEAN as as they they should be i think because because asean does have clout if if it's willing to act together but it's becoming more and more difficult for asean to do that last question carl mm -hmm. um you know we've established that people are nice and friendly uh and vital and there's great possibility for the country going forward if a few things get worked out somehow um but i i never asked you about the food how's the food well, you know, it's the food is kind of halfway between India and Southeast Asia, which shouldn't surprise you. <laughs> As the people. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it's uh, they, they they have they have good curries and they uh, they they. Uh, like, would you would you go there today? Of, well, you know, there's a there's a. Burmese restaurant right here in town called Yangon down down in Chinatown here and so yeah. and and it actually is pretty representative of, of Myanmar food so you can go try it you don't even have to you don't have to travel to Yangon to do it <laughs> <laughs> would you go there today would you go to Yangon you know I mean assuming that it was safe from a you know uh, the pandemic point of view uh is, is, is it worth traveling to uh, Myanmar Oh, you know, actually, you know, there's a lot of history, not necessarily so much in Yangon, but if you go up into uh, into into the Bagan and the Mandalay region, it's it's really really quite interesting. And if you and I, if you venture out even further, I, I haven't, but if you would venture out even further into some of these more remote areas, like uh, like uh, uh, up up into the up to the Shan and the uh, and the Kachin area, I mean, those are quite interesting areas. They they've got a lot of a lot of remains from the old empire you know the old the old empire actually ran all the way all the way across thailand and uh and laos and cambodia or part, parts of uh, cambodia so it, 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 it there's interesting history you know when you when you fly into yangon it's it's like coming into the midwest where you see a little church in each town in 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 uh, Myanmar, you see little little temples in each town with the uh, with the shooters sticking the gold shooters sticking out, and uh, you know so it, it feels feels like a very very uh, very Buddhist place, and it and it's very uh, very much uh, oriented to to the religion. Thank you, Carl. Carl Baker, uh, senior advisor to Pacific Forum. I really appreciate you coming on discussing this with us. Very important. We understand. Uh, you know, the international world around us and every nook and cranny of it. Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks, Jay. Aloha.